Canada. It won't... Oh, all right. Um, in, in the world, there's about 15 species of marmots. In Canada, there's four species of marmots. And, and I just can't get over how chunky this particular hoary marmot is. That's, that's an impressive amount of chunk for any marmot. And those, the hoary marmot, the yellow-bellied marmot, which is this guy over here, and our Vancouver Island marmot are the only three species that normally occur in British Columbia. But this is the only one that occurs normally on Vancouver Island. Roger accepted at the Empress. Uh, the Vancouver Island marmot, as you might guess, is an endemic species that occurs only on the island. Its closest relative is the hoary marmot, and presumably they shared a common ancestor at some point in the past. But the Vancouver Island marmot is still distinct. It has distinct coloration, it has distinct behaviors, uh, many of its morphological characteristics, like its skull measurements, are distinct as well from hoary marmots. So this is it, you know, this is basically the global range of the Vancouver Island marmot. And even historically, you know, there would have been more dots on this map, you know, in the central spine of the island. But really, south of Lake Cowichan, so unfortunately for the Victoria Natural History Society, in your, in your area, there's not likely to be many marmots because there's no subalpine habitat. And in the central spine, all the way up, and in, in the past, I'm almost certain there were many, many more colonies up to around Mount Seth and maybe up even into the Nimkish range, uh, the Bonanza range. And so in terms of where marmots live, Vancouver Island marmots, as I mentioned, they, they are a subalpine species. So they live typically between 800 meters and 1600 meters in elevation. They live in areas where snow really scrapes the landscape and keeps the landscape relatively tree free. So this is a picture of marble meadows. And I'm not sure if this is what I would call typical marmot habitat. Marble meadows is pretty spectacular, but um, it is, you can see how, you know, there's little scraps of vegetation and there's a few trees and little pockets. But really, snow action is keeping this area tree free. But there does have to be enough gravel in these spots, enough soil for marmots to be able to dig down into, into the, quite deep into the ground. So they'll dig hibernation chambers, hibernacula that are anywhere from two to four meters deep and have multiple chambers. And I mean, you look at this stuff and it's pretty unbelievable that there's marmots digging, you know, meters deep into this soil. But, but this has been a really successful site. That open space, that open sort of tree free, that's a really important characteristic of marmot habitat because that's how they detect their predators. They really rely on basically looking like they're asleep on top of a rock, uh, looking down slope for predators. And if a predator comes, a marmot will typically uh, start by standing up and then run to its burrow and then whistle just before it goes into its burrow for safety. And they're pretty broad eaters. They're herbivores, but they'll eat uh, just about anything that's green or brown. So they love wildflowers, lupin and saxifrage, but they'll also, uh, they'll even eat tree bark at times if, if everything else is covered by snow. They also eat our cameras on a regular basis. So they'll, they'll try anything they can get their teeth onto. Living in that kind of a habitat where snow generally comes in is as often as early as mid-September, uh, certainly by November, and then last, I mean, there's still meters of snow on the ground in many of these spots. The marmots have to survive that somehow, and because they're not migrators, they don't move up or down slope. Instead, they hibernate, and they are one of the few mammals that hibernates for a longer period of time than they are active. So. Marmots will typically, Vancouver Island marmots will typically hibernate for about seven months of the year. And then they're only active really for about five months of the year. During that hibernation, they're gonna lose up to 30% of their body mass. And most of that body mass is actually gonna be used during what we call arousal period. So roughly once every two weeks, a marmot is going to slowly come out of the deepest stage of its hibernation, get just active enough to move off to a different chamber, have a pee break, and then it will come back and settle back down into its uh, deep torpor. During that torpor, their breathing rate is really slow, just a couple breaths a minute. Uh, their heart rate is extremely slow. Their metabolic rate is slow. Their digestive system is completely atrophied. 
So they're really, their bodies are not doing a whole lot during that time. And then hopefully in the next, oh gosh, next three weeks to a month, uh, the marmots will actually start to emerge. And they often have to both dig out through these soil plugs that they've made at the entrances to their hibernacula, and then perhaps dig out through a meter or more of snow up to the surface. During that time, when they first emerge from hibernation, the marmots are really, really vulnerable. They're vulnerable in part because all of that energy that they've stored, this is when they're using a vast amount of it, but their digestive system still hasn't really reinvigorated. And so they can't really digest food. They, um, they don't have any way of processing it. So you'll see often, we'll see marmots that just emerge from hibernation and then they actually, that's when they end up dying. They, they literally starve to death. Um, sometimes a couple of years ago, we had a marmot that came out of hibernation and I guess it was too snowy or something. So it just went back into hibernation, but it, it went back into torpor right on the snow, like just right at the entrance to its uh, hibernation chamber. So it, it never actually went back underground. So this is a, a really challenging time for the marmots. And for female marmots, it's even more challenging because this is when they're reproducing. So they're being impregnated right as they're coming out of hibernation. So right as their body reserves are at their absolute lowest, uh, females are getting pregnant and that pregnancy will really prevent them from regaining any body condition even once they start eating. Then they'll give birth in about a month, typically to somewhere between three and four marmots, but anywhere from two to six. Um, those pups then are gonna start nursing off of mom for the first month. And again, because she's, she's providing milk, that means that she's really not able to regain any body mass during that time. After about a month, so at this point we're talking about early July, uh, the young pups will emerge from the den and they'll go and they'll start to forage and, and mom will wean them and she'll finally be able to start regaining body mass. But you can imagine the challenge that that puts on a female marmot's body, right? So you have five months already to regain all of the body mass that you're losing during seven months of hibernation. And then if a female is going to reproduce, that time frame is really shortened from five months down to just three months that she has to regain enough body mass to survive the next hibernation. And we think as a result, what we often see is that marmots will skip a year of reproduction. So females typically only give birth once every other year, but certainly in places like uh, captivity, we see that they often reproduce much more often. So they'll often reproduce every year, or two years out of three. So we think it's probably tied to their body condition. The pups in the meanwhile will generally stay with their mom and dad for a couple of years before venturing out on their own. Um, one of the questions that we get asked all the time is like, what, what, you know, what is the role of the marmot? Why are they important in the landscape? Or what do they do out there? And, you know, I hate to say it, but these answers, nothing, like there's 250 of them. There's not enough of them to do anything on the landscape. Whatever role Vancouver Island marmots had to play in our ecosystem, I mean, that was, that was lost when we lost the marmot. It's gone maybe we'll get it back. And, and I hope that that's the right question to ask is what kind of role could Vancouver Island marmots play in our ecosystems if we had enough of them? We look at other more abundant marmot species and the kind of roles that they play in ecosystems. And we know that you know, they play a really important role turning over soils. These subalpine ecosystems are really, really harsh environments. And so by turning over soils and making fresh nutrients available, that probably or could potentially play a big role in providing those nutrients to that rich variety of subalpine plants that we see up there. And we know from other marmot species that that's certainly the case in, in for marmots like horny marmots and Himalaya marmots. Himalaya marmots, um, we know that they play a really important role by providing burrows and hibernacula and become refuge for other species. Again, this is a really, really harsh ecosystem. And so having a place where other species can get out of the weather is really important. And even in Vancouver Island marmot, 
uh, burrows, we see lots of other species that seem to be occupying those burrows in hibernacula. So we see western toads and garter snakes, many species of pollinators. And these are all species that are really at the absolute kind of elevational extreme of their range. They can't get much higher than that. So those burrows may play an important role in allowing those species to survive at the very edges of their potential range. So what, you know, if we look back, um, marmots, marmots were certainly doing a lot better than they are today. Uh, they likely initially diverged from the hoary marmots somewhere around 740,000 years ago or before then, although there's almost certainly been interbreeding since that time. Marmot bones have been found in sea caves, um, probably about 8,000 8, to 8,500 years old. And, and that kind of makes sense, right? During glacial periods, marmot habitat would have expanded right down to sea level. And we see like Alaska marmots there um, setting up shop right in, you know, sea wharves and on the rocks on the beach. Uh, so marmots can live at sea level as long as the habitat's appropriate. But then as the glaciers receded and marmot habitat receded elevationally, that the marmots probably receded with it until they were confined to basically the tops of our mountains on Vancouver Island. And right now, I mean, there's, they're, they're basically right at the top of most of our mountains. We're very close to it. There's not a lot of up left for marmots to move. We know that um, in the past, humans have consumed marmots. And, and we know that First Nations on Vancouver Island had a really complex relationship with Vancouver Island marmots. And it's not a relationship I'm gonna talk about. I've been fortunate enough to have some conversations with uh, First Nations elders about their relationship with the marmots, but it's not something that's shared with uh, the broader community, the non-band um, non community. So it's, it's not something I'm gonna talk about, but just to be aware that there was that relationship and that it was an important relationship for many First Nations on Vancouver Island. So then what happened? We know that they were first assessed as endangered around 1978, but it's really unclear when the population really first began really declining. Uh, certainly by the 1990s, it was clear that the population was crashing. And then at its absolute nadir in 2003, there were a total of well, we were able to count 26 marmots um, left in the wild, 10 at Mount Washington, and the remaining 16 scattered between four different colonies in the Nanaimo Lakes area. So, you know, that was, um, that was pretty much it. We had over the preceding years, we captured 55 marmots and brought them into captivity. Uh, and they were at the Toronto Zoo and Calgary Zoo initially. And the assumption at the time was that marmots were going to go extinct in the wild and that those zoom individuals would be the last remaining individuals of this species on the planet. It was pretty close, didn't quite hit that, that mark. So, I mean, I think the big question is like, where did the whistle go? Like, where, where did our marmots disappear to? Um, and again, you know, the easy answer is always, we don't know. Like, nobody was really watching marmots, I hate to say it, but they live in pretty harsh environments. They're not always visible. I can give you lots of examples of days when I've hiked into a marmot meadow and I can shine around with telemetry for the marmots that we've released. And I know there's marmots there because they've got transmitters in them. So I can detect them and see that they're alive and underground, but I don't actually see a marmot. So during the 1980s and 1990s, as naturalists in particular were hiking into these sites and coming back and saying that they weren't seeing marmots in places where they expected to. I think it was it was overly easy to dismiss that as uh, well. You know, we don't always see marmots; they're not always there, um, and there weren't really a ton of comprehensive surveys of the marmot population. What what did become clear, though, is that during the 1990s, it, finally people recognized that there was there was a real problem, and that certainly was thanks to individuals like Andrew Bryant and the Cowgen Valley Naturalists who um, put a lot of effort into raising the alarm. There was something seriously wrong with the population. But having said that, the marmots themselves, like marmot habitat is a subalpine meadow. You can't log a tree-free meadow. 
but you can't, you know, nobody builds homes there. There's very few people that venture there. And so there's this kind of question about like, why did they disappear? And certainly um, we think that there was a role that predators played, but that, the role that predators played in eating marmots, the, the proximate cause of death for virtually every marmot is, is a predator. They get eaten by cougars, they get eaten by wolves, they get eaten by golden eagles. But the reason, one of the reasons we think that this is maybe happening more often than it did in the past is this wide network of roads that were put into much of Vancouver Island. We know that predators use those roads to expand their territories fairly dramatically, and it may have reduced the energy cost for a predator to really go up in elevation to be able to reach the marmots. At the same time, a lot of logging activity and development activity at the bottom of our valleys have pushed deer and elk herds up into higher elevations as well. And those are primary prey species for cougars and wolves. So if the cougar and wolf packs are already higher and it's easier for them to go even a little bit higher, then you know, maybe they're spending more time now in marmot meadows than they used to in the past. Another threat to Vancouver and the marmots has been golden eagles. And Golden eagles certainly were not a common species on the island until the introduction of cottontail rabbits. And the suspicion is that cottontail rabbits provided a year round food source for golden eagles and, and it enabled some uh, eagles to start nesting on the island. And for those eagles, they can cover huge distances and, and marmots are just, that, that is their price food, right? So they happily eat marmots. We also know that to a marmot, a high elevation cut block looks a lot like a meadow. And this was a really big problem. Marmots would disperse from their natal colony. And in the past, they would go and they would find another colony that they would live in, another natural colony. But with high elevation cut blocks near marmot colonies, what was happening instead is a lot of marmots, instead of going off to another colony, they were just occupying a, a nearby cut block looked like marmot habitat. And bluntly, Vancouver and the marmots do fantastic in cut blocks for about six or seven years. But cut blocks, of course, had trees in them and they're gonna have trees in them again. And as those trees regrow, it cuts off the sight lines that marmots need. And what we find is that marmots do great in a cut block for six or seven years. And then very quickly after that, uh, the entire colony will be predated. Um, sometimes it takes a couple of years. Uh, in some extreme cases, it was, you know, a few months, it would seem that an entire colony would disappear. So, you know, if you think about even a large protected area like Strathcona Park, and marmots were completely extirpated from Strathcona Park, you know, it feels like there should be enough habitat there to sustain marmots, but the boundaries of the park means that this is a relatively small island. And the marmot habitat within the park is even smaller islands still. So those really small colonies of marmots, they really rely on the rescue effect. You know, maybe a cougar gets into a colony and eats a bunch of marmots, but that's, you know, that's okay because there's gonna be another marmot, you know, a, a dispersing marmot from another nearby colony is gonna come, it's gonna uh, set up shop, it, and it's gonna rescue that colony. So that network of dispersers is really important to maintaining these colonies. And any colony in isolation just isn't that large. It's only probably 30 marmots, maybe a few more, a few less. And that eventually isn't going to be able to persist. So this network of, of marmots dispersing is really important. But you can see, you know, there's a lot of former marmot habitat that used to occur outside the boundaries of the park. Um, and there's this big lake that didn't used to live in the middle of the park either. Uh, Strathcona Dam created but a lake. This used to be a river. We know that marmots can cross small bodies of water, but they're not spectacular swimmers as far as we can tell. So, you know, you just remove all of those potential dispersal routes, and suddenly this is a much weaker network of, of dispersal, potential dispersers, right? So your rescue effect is a lot reduced. You lose a couple of those colonies to predation or some other event. Um, and suddenly this just isn't sustainable. You know, there's not enough dispersers there to really keep this going. So by the time we started recovery efforts 
and we released our first marmots in 2004. Again, there were 10 marmots left at Mount Washington. They were showing pretty serious signs of inbreeding. Um, so that we think they've been isolated there for some time. And, and then really 16 marmots scattered between four colonies in the Nanaimo Lakes region. 2004, we released our first four marmots. Um, within a month, three of them had been eaten by a cougar. And the fourth one was brought back into captivity because we figured it was going to be eaten by a cougar too. Uh, so that wasn't very successful. But uh, we continued to release marmots to the wild. Um, and fortunately, we had a lot more success in the Nanaimo Lakes area and were able to start getting that population back up. And it wasn't until 2007 that we first started introducing marmots back to Strathcona Provincial Park. Initially in Strathcona Park, I should note, they had horrible success. Um, it, was, it was really challenging to release marmots there and watch almost all the marmots that we released there fail. And uh, we think that it was you know, a combination of a harsher environment, but also that marmots had been extirpated for Strathcona Park for an unknown period of time. And all of that infrastructure that they create, that two meter to four meter deep hibernacula that they're gonna live in for in a winter, uh, they'd all fallen into disrepair. And so now you've got a marmot that is coming out of captivity, it's going into the wild, that's a pretty big adjustment on its own. And then not only does it have to get enough body fat to be able to survive for its first wild hibernation, but it's kind of managed to dig a hibernacula on top of that. And it just, it just didn't work for most of our captive marmots. So fortunately, we were able to, um, to find some other techniques for releasing marmots to Strathcona Park that have been more successful. And this is our, this is our colony map today. So um, we do have you know, around 25, 26 colonies, depending on exactly what year and what we're able to get out to. Uh, but most of those colonies are pretty small. You know, Mount Aerosmith is quite large, probably around 30 marmots. This complex up here in Strathcona Park is probably pretty big, you know, maybe around 20, 30 marmots total between all of those colonies. Most of the colonies are still really small. We're talking, you know, two to five marmots. Um, so they're not, not large colonies yet. But having a, a large number of colonies that marmots can disperse between, I think is going to be really important for this species to be able to sustain itself in the wild in the future. So you look at the population here, 31 marmots after we released marmots and they had pups in 2003 um, or 2004, 31 marmots at one point in 2003, but that fell by the end of the year. And then, you know, in 2013, things were looking pretty good. And so at that point we decided we would stop releasing marmots to the Nanaimo Lakes area and see how the population did. And it, and it seemed to do all right for a little while, uh, but then it, it crashed. And, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's easy to look back now and say, there are a lot of marmots in that area that were either pups that, you know, they just don't have great survival, or they were older marmots that really probably aren't gonna contribute much to the population anymore. You know, once a marmot reaches eight, the chances that it's gonna have a lot more pups in the future, some do, but few of them do, you know, it, chances are pretty good that that marmot's not going to contribute a lot of pups. So a few cougar predations and suddenly the population in the Nanaimo Lakes region really crashed. Fortunately, the last few years have been a lot better. Um, and this past year in particular has, was, was really, uh, you know, quite a wonderful year from our perspective. We found three new colonies of marmots and the population increased by about 30%. Um, that's not going to happen every year and we will have other declines. There's just no way that a small population like this isn't going to experience pretty significant fluctuations in its population. But, but I'll take the good years and we can get it. Oh, I already talked about this because that's what happens when you invite me to talk. I ramble and so I, I already talked a little bit about uh, our challenges releasing marmots to Strathcona Park and trying to find some other ways to do it. And the big one for us was to start releasing marmots for one year to Mount Washington. So what we found is marmots, when they disperse, they do get lost sometimes, they end up in weird spots. 
Uh, we recovered one from a woodshed near Qualicum Beach a couple of years ago. Uh, if you look on iNaturalist, speaking of iNaturalist, you'd think there's a huge population of marmots right around the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, but that's all literally one marmot. That's Alan, who uh, we don't know how he got there. So we capture those marmots and we translocate them back to natural habitat. And what we found is the marmots that we translocated into Strathcona Park had way better success than our captive bred marmots. That wasn't really the case in the Nanaimo Lakes area. Further south, the captive bred marmots had almost as good success as the wild marmots did. So what we started doing with our captive bred marmots was we started releasing them to Mount Washington for a year, where generally speaking, their survival is really, really high. And then we would trap them the following year and translocate them into Strathcona Park. And, and it made a massive difference in our success there. So it went, we went from needing to release about 26 captive bred marmots into Strathcona Park to get one prime breeding age adult, to needing to release about six captive bred marmots to Strathcona Park to get one breeding age adult. It's just a huge difference. Just to be uh, clear, it would take about five wild marmots. So, um, they're still not doing quite as well as wild marmots, but, but it's a lot closer. So today, that's the only way that we'll release marmots to Strathcona. Either it's a wild marmot that's being pulled from inappropriate habitat, or it's a marmot that's gone through this stepping stone process before it's being released to Strathcona. Another approach we've taken both in Nanaimo Lakes and in Strathcona um, was something that we noticed in our captive breeding program, which was that marmots in the captive breeding program were way more prolific than our wild marmots were. And we suspected that was because of their body condition. And so we started providing supplemental food for, for marmots, targeted to female marmots, but we can't control which marmots eat it. Um, so lots of pups and males eat it too. And we think that that supplemental food, and we only have anecdotal evidence so far, but we are working on a study with the Calgary Zoo right now to see, to see if we can actually quantify the impact. But our anecdotal observations is that marmots that have access to the supplemental food seem to reproduce uh, way more often than marmots that don't have it. And we don't really think it influences survival. We don't think it helps them um, gain enough body condition to make it all the way through hibernation. But we do think it might help the females just get over that barrier, you know, be able to recover body condition more quickly enough to reproduce just a little bit more often. So where are, where, are, you know, where, what's the future for the Vancouver Island marmot? Um, right now there's about 250, 258. Uh, this winter is what our sort of median of our high and low counts were. There was about a 30% increase from last year and, you know, roughly 10 times the number of marmots that we started with in 2003, 2004. Um, but it's not a lot of marmots, right? I mean, 250 is still, you know, one of the world's rarest mammal species. You know, by comparison, there's four to 800 mountain gorillas in the wild. A similar number of Siberian tigers, you know, there's like 1,500 giant pandas. Um, so this, this species is still at the very brink of extinction. We do know that we have more tools now to try and recover the species. Um, we know how to breed marmots. We have better senses of how to support them in the wild. We've reestablished some of that critical, or really, we've, been, we've let the marmots reestablish some of those that critical habitat that those hibernacula and burrows uh, that they need to survive and that they use generation after generation. But I'd be, um, but I'd be lying to say that, that the future is certainly all rosy for marmots. You know, one of the challenges that a species faces after a severe population bottleneck is genetic diversity. And marmots don't have a lot of, Vancouver and marmots don't have a lot of genetic diversity left. I think the, you know, the optimistic silver lining there is that from the period when we started the captive breeding program to today, we haven't lost any genetic diversity. So we've been able to retain everything that we started with, but it's, it's not a lot. It's probably enough. Marmots don't seem to show a lot of signs of inbreeding. It's probably enough to reestablish a wild population. But if there's changes in the environment, um, it might be difficult for marmots to adapt to those changes. And you know you have to 
know that there have been changes in the environment. And there have been more changes in subalpine environments than there have been in sea level environments. So this is Castle Crag. This is a, a, one of the Marmot Meadows in Strathcona Provincial Park. This is a photo from 1977, and this was 2018. The amount of tree cover in that area has increased by over 50%. Some of the Marmot Meadows that we looked at, tree cover had increased by 250%. Um, as we lose snow energy due to climate change, that snow energy is really what's responsible for keeping these areas relatively tree free. So the forests are marching up the slopes of the mountains. And as I mentioned at the beginning, marmots are basically already at the top of most of the mountains. There's not a lot of up left for marmots to go. Climate modeling for Vancouver Island marmot habitat is pretty grand. One of the reasons we really, you know, despite horrifically poor success initially, one of the reasons that we really wanted to establish marmots in the Strathcona Park was because climate modeling suggests that that would be one of the last areas where there would be marmot habitat left. We can do something about that. You know, we can, we can go in and remove uh, small trees and limbs to reestablish those sight lines that marmots really rely on. They seem pretty adaptable. There's probably a lot of other vegetation changes that are occurring in these ecosystems as well, but the marmots, um, the marmots are willing to eat just about anything and they seem, seem to do all right on uh, a wide variety of plant foods. So manually restoring this habitat, I think uh, is going to be necessary to, in order for this habitat to remain, and especially in the Nanaimo Lakes region for, uh, for the foreseeable future. But I am cautiously optimistic. I really think that there is a place in the wild for the Vancouver Island marmot. And I think this is a species that we can recover. We are incredibly fortunate that their habitat is remote, that it is not of a lot of economic interest, um, because that means that it still exists. You know, it's still there for us to restore, even if it needs restoration. I think that recovering the marmot I mean, sometimes it's difficult, you know, why, why are we spending all of this time and energy on what amounts to an oversized squirrel that sleeps for seven months of the year? Um, I mean, I personally, I think there's, there's a moral reason for us to recover the Vancouver Island marmot and any other species that finds itself in these dire straits as a result of our activities. But unfortunately, one of the other reasons for recovering the Vancouver Island marmot is that we have the resources to do it here in Canada and we need to prove that it's possible. You know, there's not been a lot of mammal species that have been recovered from fewer than 100 individuals left. And unfortunately, this situation is likely to come up a lot more often in the future. So we need to be able to prove that we can bring even our most endangered species back um, because otherwise people will give up hope. Now, it's certainly something we hear about with the marmots all the time is that they're doomed and we shouldn't bother because they're just going to go extinct anyways. So proving that, that it is possible, I think, is, is really important. And that, that's really the sum total of my ramblings for this evening. Did I talk for about the right length of time? I can't tell anymore. Um, yeah, that was great. I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions about the marmots. Or... Um, thank you, Adam. We've got some questions in the chat. I can read them out to you if you would like. <laughs> sure, I'm just looking at the chat now. So I'm looking <laughs> at it backwards. How large is the marmot? Is it a, an oversized squirrel? I just called it an oversized squirrel, but it is actually, it is in terms of body weight, it's about the size of a large house cat. So um, anywhere from two to six kilos. Um, so in pounds, that's we're at like five to 12 pounds. Uh, but if you actually like pick a marmot up or see one in the wild, I don't know, like I, it must be their fur, but they seem like a lot bigger than a house cat to me. Um, but they're not that large, but they are, they are significantly larger than a, even a gray squirrel. Yeah. Uh, is there still an active colony on Heather Mountain? Yes. Um, there is an active colony on Heather Mountain, and we were really pleased to discover that 
there were two marmots left there the year before last, and they had pups. And there's now a colony of six or seven marmots there. And we're able to release a couple more marmots to support that colony. And you know, my fingers are crossed that in May and June we're going to get back out there and we're going to see a whole bunch of marmots. But um, but of course, these colonies do, especially these really small colonies that are right on the brink. Um, they are really vulnerable to any kind of predator that might get in there or any other kind of weather event that might happen. Um, how many captive marmots are there? Currently, there are 96 captive marmots, uh, 30 of which are due to be released to the wild this year. And where are they? So there's a captive population at the Calgary Zoo. There's a captive population at the Toronto Zoo. And we have a captive population of Vancouver Island marmots on Mount Washington. We have a purpose-built facility at the ski hill there that is both a breeding center and also a staging area. So all the marmots that are going to be released are there, as well as a breeding population. Do we still have human shepherds uh, in colonies to keep predators away? We don't do shepherding anymore. And there's a couple of reasons. The big one is it costs a lot of money to shepherd and um, you don't have that much money. And the other reason is that unless you keep shepherding, so unless you have that individual there, the marmots get eaten. So as soon as those shepherds were leaving the colonies, the predators were moving in right away. And so it was really difficult for us to maintain that. So, uh, so we haven't been doing shepherding uh, probably for the past decade now. Will climate change reduce the length of hibernation, potentially allowing more time for recovery before the next winter? We don't know. Maybe. Um, there's a lot of concerns about that. And I wouldn't actually tie the length of time that marmots are active to their ability to recover their body condition. So one of our concerns is that if marmots emerge too early, the vegetation may not be there for them yet to actually feed on. So, uh, so that could be an issue. The other issue is that if they go into hibernation too late, the vegetation, we actually saw this a couple of years ago. Okay, more than a couple of years ago. My goodness, I'm getting old. Um, but nevertheless, we had a, a really extended fall and all of the vegetation on the hillsides nest, but temperatures were really staying quite warm and the marmots were staying active. And they had really poor overwinter survival that year. So in essence, the food quality was reduced and the marmots were actually burning energy in order to stay awake rather than just going into hibernation. So we would, I would, what we've seen is that their survival is best when they have a good winter and, and a harsh winter doesn't really seem to bother them that much. Um, can I give you an email to contact me further? Oh, absolutely. You can contact me at adam at marmots.org and I can try and type that into the chat here. There we go. Um, is there anywhere where you could see a Vancouver Island marmot before one dies? Um, I, I presume before the human dies rather than the marmot because the marmots are always at risk of dying. I hate to say it, but, but obviously the, the easy answer is Mount Washington. Literally the ski hill at Mount Washington. They, it has been one of the most successful areas for the Vancouver Island marmot. And if you ride the chairlift, you can often see marmots under the chairlift. And if you hike up the mountain, um, up the ski hill there during the summertime, uh, we can give you a map and, and give you a sense of where to go to see marmots. If you wanna see marmots, I mean, I, I do love seeing them at Mount Washington, but there, it is special to actually see them in more natural habitat. And, and if you want to see one in more natural habitat, I think probably the, the most accessible area is Mount Aerosmith. And at Mount Aerosmith is also home to a really successful colony of marmots. They're much, much harder to see there. So this is this is my spot, the marmot, just to everybody. I've been showing you these beautiful pictures of marmots up close, but that's not what you see when you go out to look at marmots in natural habitat. So, I mean, this one's easy to see because I've drawn a nice square around it. So everybody, I assume, has spotted the marmot by now, right? Um, I can't tell because you're on Zoom, so I'm just going to assume it's, it's here. The marmot is here. Um, and this is kind of what we see, right, is, you know, we spend a lot of time scanning the tops of rocks going, is that a rock or is that a marmot head? 
This one's nice because you know he's backlit by snow. This is at Mount Washington, obviously. This is the kind of thing you see, you know, marmots sleeping on the top of the rocks, watching down slope for their predators. Um, this is like a classic, you are actually way closer to a marmot than you think you are. It's right there, literally right in front of you. Um, but it's not moving very fast unless you really start to look at it hard and it gets alert. Um, but Again, I, you know, I can't tell because you're on snow, so I assume everybody can see this little white nose poking out of the rocks, giving us a watch. This is at Steamboat Mountain. It's not a spot I recommend that you go to. Well, if you're into really nice hikes, it takes about 14 hours to hike. And, um, it's a great spot for Mermaid, so. And again, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, sometimes you see marmots in weird spots. So there is a marmot in this photo. Um, this is our, I mentioned the marmot that we found in a woodshed behind Qualicum Beach. This is it. Um, well, I mean, we didn't find it actually. The family found it when they went out to split wood and phoned us. Uh, and if you do see a marmot that's not Roger, please, we know about Roger. I mean, not like Roger. I don't know what we think about Roger. Um, but, uh, but if you see a marmot that isn't Roger, please let us know. Um, if it's a yellow-bellied marmot, we'll try and trap it and relocate it back to the mainland. And if it's a Vancouver Island marmot, um, even if it's in natural habitat, we'll leave it alone, but we still want to know about it. And if it's in a woodshed, we'll try and trap it and bring it to natural habitat. So that's just a little bit of fur at the back. That's it. That's our marmot, Chopper, who um, is now part of our captive breeding program. So you asked earlier about the size of marmots, and this is um, this, oh, this gives, sorry, I'm just all over the map here now. This gives you a sense of the size of marmots. I'm gonna stop pushing buttons. So significantly larger than a red squirrel. The marten is actually the most common species that we get from people who think they've seen a marmot but have made a mistaken identity, um, but quite a bit smaller than most dogs. They mean they were the smallest of dogs. All right. And somebody notes that adopting a marmot is a great present for birthdays. Or for, it is. You should all adopt marmots. Everybody needs, and if you have adopted a marmot, consider adopting a second marmot, a whole marmot family. Um, I, I jest there, but it is why this species still exists. I mean, literally, right? Like donors have enabled us to do this work and to save this species. And if it weren't for, those individuals, and we don't have a lot of big donors, you know, so we really are talking about, you know, those $10, $100 a year people. Um, that's why this species still exists. That's the bottom line. Without that, this species would be extinct today. I have absolutely no doubt about that. I don't see any new questions, so I'm going to say thank you and turn it back over to Stefan, if I can. Yeah, sure. But um, I was wondering, before now you stopped sharing. Can you show oh. us one of your videos? <laughs> sure. I think people would enjoy that. All right, so uh, we'll go down to it um, So this is, uh, this is Wolfgang. Unfortunately, Wolfgang uh, passed away in 20, 2017, 2018. Um, but he was living at a place called Haley Lake Ecological Reserve. Haley Lake was actually created in order to protect uh, Vancouver and environment habitat. And um, this is kind of what you see a lot of from adult marmots, right? I mean, this one, Wolfgang's pretty alert, right? He's aware that somebody's sitting there filming him. Um, but, but it's a pretty good zoom lens that the camera operator is using. And uh, so he's not it's not too, too concerned about it. Well, and that's our field coordinator, Shaney Jackson. So I like Shaney, but, um, but nobody wants to see the video of people. Um, we, know, we know who the stars are. So again, you know, just moving through and eating stuff. They don't tend to be um, super, super quick, you know, right? They're not, they're not like the Martin, you know, these hyperactive slinkies that are jumping all around. 
Uh, they're not always as slow as Wolfgang is. Like Wolfgang is pretty sedate there. This is a group of pops at Mount Aerosmith. Um, we set up a wildlife camera, a camera trap just outside of uh, the hibernacula. And, um, you know, they, they do a lot of this sort of tussling and wrestling and, um, you know, moving back and forth. So they can, and they're, they, man, they scare you. Like these, at Mount Aerosmith, I've watched pups climb up cliffs and then tumble off the cliff, like must be 30 feet. And uh, you think, oh my God, I just, you know, I just watched a marmot die. But then it bounds away and does it again. And you know, like they're, they're tough little critters and um, really good at surviving in their, in their habitat. All right, there we go. There's your, there's your video. So Thank I'll stop you. There. That's great. Thanks for doing that. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute and, um, and ask Adam. We're, um, I, I have a quick question for you if nobody else does. Um, could you give us a really quick overview of how you study them? Like how many people you have on staff and do you, you mentioned um, radio telemetry and I'm just wondering what your field season looks like. Yeah, so our field season starts at the beginning of May with training. We have uh, five field staff, a field coordinator, um, our wildlife veterinarian, Malcolm McKay, who's been on the project since, since before the project officially started. And that's it. So really um, a total of about seven people. And that Malcolm spends a lot of his time with the captive marmots at the Mount Washington Center as well. Um, from there, literally every weekday, pretty much every, every sunny day, um, whether it's a weekday or not, you are headed out to a marmot colony. You're usually driving out and then hiking into the colony. Sometimes like Haley Lake is an easy hike, you know, it's only about 30 minutes into the colony. Some of the other colonies are a couple hours or more in. Some of them you have to move in and like Strathcona Park really to monitor the marmots, you have to move in and camp. All of the marmots that we release, we release with um, implanted radio telemetry. So uh, it's a transmitter that sit, um, emits a, a radio frequency pulse. And the speed of that pulse is response to the body temperature of the marmot. So we can tell if the marmot's alive, we can tell if it's uh, deceased, if it's a mark, uh, and usually we can tell if it's in hibernation. The reason we use radio telemetry and not some of the fancy, like we'd really like to use GPS, it would make our lives a lot easier. Because um, you have to actually go out and be in the meadow to use radio telemetry or in a helicopter, but helicopters are brutally expensive, so we don't get to do that very often. Um, but but the issue for the marmots is one that they have these really dramatic changes in body weight over the course of the year. So if you put a collar on the marmot, it's either going to fall off the marmot when the marmot's skinny, skinny, or it's going to strangle the marmot, you know, when it's when it's not so skinny. And neither of those are particularly useful outcomes. Um, so we can't put anything on the outside of the marmot. We can't have something that goes into the marmot that has an antenna to, that sticks out of their skin the way you do in some other species because the marmots, one, are very fastidious about cleaning, so they'll just gnaw it off, really, the, the antenna will be gone, literally in minutes. But even if it didn't, the marmots are semi-fossoral, so they're going underground and in and out of the ground through these really tight little openings all the time, and that, um, you know, that area where the antenna emerged from the skin, that would be an infection point, so we don't think they would do well there. But one of these days, I really hope that we can get something like GPS or something and manage to follow these guys in a different way because the radio telemetry is, um, is hard on my knees. But, uh, but then, you know, during, so during the active season, we're trying to monitor the marmots. And I, I didn't say this when I talked about our work. So I should mention, you know, the Marmot Recovery Foundation, our job is to recover the Vancouver Island marmot. We're not a research organization. We are, um, I mean, we're more like engineers, right? We take the science that other people are doing, we try and implement it, use it to recover this species. But most of that monitoring work that we do is really aimed at answering pretty, you know, questions that are coming up next. Like, where do we release marmots to? 
you know, we've only got roughly 30 marmots to release, for instance, this year. So if we're going to maximize their success, we have to know where there's a single female marmot, where there's a lone male marmot, you know, where there is a family or a couple families that are already doing really well, and, and we can only make that situation worse. So a lot of our monitoring isn't so much designed to do um, comprehensive population surveys or to build a population model. It's really designed to try and answer those questions. Where do we release a marmot? Where have marmots gone lost? How are our captive marmots that we release to the wild? How are they doing? That kind of thing. Um, and then we work with other partners like Vancouver Island University and the Calgary Zoo and the Wilder Institute to, to actually engage in that harder science. Um, so yeah, so that was a long answer to your question. I tend to do that more in no, advance. That was, that was great. No, thank you. Any other questions for, um, for Adam? Well, we wish you a very uh, good field season and lots of success with the releases this, uh, this summer. And um, thank you so much for sharing your, your work and the work of the Recovery Foundation. And uh, we will follow along and, and I'm sure you'll have some new uh, adopted marmots coming from this group. <laughs> Thank you for, for allowing me to ramble on about marmots for so long. <laughs> and I know that many of the people here support our work. And, and again, thank you so much for making it possible for us to work with this species. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody so much for coming to the AGM and for coming here to this talk and um, wishing you all a, a wonderful, um, uh, spring and summer. Maybe we'll see you out at some events and some other talks and, um, and we'll be back to Natural History Night in, in September. So all the best to you. I'm going to stop recording. And uh, there we go.